in the briefing meeting. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions about any items um, on the regular meeting agenda for this evening? All right, and are there any items that anyone would like to add to the agenda for the briefing meeting other than what's on our published agenda? Commissioners, I might have. I'm looking for a gentleman. He asked if we can introduce him tonight. He's the congressman's um, field office representative. He's not here yet, but if he does show up, I'll later add uh, introduce The briefing meeting? Yes, sir. Okay, that sounds great. All right. <clears throat> um, so the first item on our agenda is an update on the strategic plan, Educated and Capable Community, and Rachel Nygaard's going to help us out with this item. Good afternoon, commissioners. This agenda item is in follow-up to a presentation that you received on February 7th, uh, which was our Educated and Capable Community Strategic Plan update. And a result of that presentation uh, was several follow-up questions that we're responding to today. We captured five questions, which are included in today's follow-up presentation. These are shown on the screen. Related to race and ethnicity breakdown, for economically disadvantaged students, grade point average, repeating a grade level or what we call retention, graduation rates, and student growth. Before we get into each of the individual questions, we wanted to begin with a little bit of context about education data in general. There are some data considerations and limitations um, that are important for us to be aware of in this conversation. And primarily, we want to um, remind the uh, commission and the community following along that Buncombe County government, while we're the ones with a, a stake in the success of these students, uh, along with all of our other community members, we as a local government don't actually own this data. Uh, the school information, we rely on publicly accessible data sources like North Carolina DPI, the Department of Public Instruction, as well as our partnerships with the K-12 school systems. And um, we have this indirect access to data, which as you'll see as we go through each of those five questions, um, sometimes make it easier and sometimes it make it more difficult to answer the questions that we hope to answer in the way that we hope to answer them. In addition, we wanted to point out that throughout these follow-up uh, responses, there are some data limitations related to student privacy. And being in a small community, many of our schools do not have numbers of subpopulations large enough to be reported um, for the purpose of public reporting um, data sets with 10 or fewer students in a certain data set can't be uh, reported out. Or if it's under 30 students, it doesn't get aggregated and calculated into the school overall school performance. And there are additional considerations that we um, encountered related to um, economically disadvantaged data, and uh, they're listed here. There are a couple of considerations around how that data is captured, one being that during the pandemic, universal free meals were offered, and often it's that student uh, free lunch that is a determining factor to, to identify economically disadvantaged status. In addition, um, there's a new uh, way in starting in 2022 for entire schools to be categorized as economically disadvantaged. Both of these are good for, for good reasons, which allow more services to students in those schools, and they have consequences, unintended consequences related to making the data more complicated. The first question on the education data follow-up list is, is there race and ethnicity breakdown information for economically disadvantaged students? So you'll remember that when we, when we did our education uh, outcomes review, 
we looked at all of the different um, attributes by race and ethnicity, as well as by economic status. And this request is to see essentially the intersection of those two characteristics. And household income is very sensitive information which is not easily accessible. The city schools and the county schools, neither one have this data as requested. So what that means is we uh, must request that from the state, from the Department of Public Instruction. And that request has been made. So we are currently waiting for a response. And the idea is that when this information comes back, um, the school systems then are able to release the data to Buncan County through the data sharing partnership that we have. And then we're able to re retain that individual anonymity, but also build that data into the future education analysis. It, we don't have a timeline on when we expect to receive it. And in the meantime, um, we hear that this is an important factor for consideration to make sure that we're appropriate look, appropriately looking at both of those demographic factors for students and student populations. And we'll continue to seek ways to incorporate that. The next follow-up question is, can we compare local GPA, grade point average, to state average GPA? I will get to some questions that have more promising responses, but this is the second one that, that is unfortunately what we found is that GPA is not comparable between school districts. So our data partners at Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools had seen that, they said that they have not seen anything um, that is a statewide GPA. The reason for this is that each school district, each school, each grade, and each classroom teacher have the ability to establish their own grading criteria. And so it is not um, compared across the state. Essentially, the state's answer is standardized tests. Um, and that's the way that we look at proficiency, like the third through eighth grade reading and math that we looked at before, or like the 11th grade ACT. Our next question is going to relate to grade level promotion and retention. So a bit of information um, explaining. Um, criteria for promotion, that's the word for moving on to the next grade level, is established by the school districts. Retention is repeating a grade, and um, that is re-enrolling for, for a second year in that same grade. There is a pretty significant difference in how retention works in the earlier grades in comparison to the high school grades. In elementary school, in grades K all the way up through eighth grade, those retention decisions are made by the school administrators with input from the teachers and the parents based on a number of different factors, uh, absences, how the student is performing academically, student growth, developmental delays, behavior. They come together and make that determination on a per child basis. In high school, in the ninth through 12th grades, it's more formulaic, and it's based on the credits earned. Students in the ninth through 12th grades may continue to progress and take courses toward their graduation. It's less sequential than it is in the earlier grades. So the question, the follow-up question that we responded to is how many students repeat at grade level? And you also asked what's the demographic breakdown? Asheville City Schools had 64 retentions in the most recent school year, which is 2021 to 2022. And that represents 1.5% of the student population. That same school year, Buncombe County Schools had 409 retentions, which was 1.8% of their student population. The majority of these were in the ninth through 12th grade. In looking at the race and ethnicity of the retentions, we see that almost 44% of students 
retained in Asheville City Schools or BRAC, which is in comparison to the data point we gave you before uh, that black students comprise 20% of the overall population within Asheville City Schools. We also do see some disparity in Buncombe County Schools. Black students comprise 9% of those retained, yet they comprise 7% of the overall student population. For Hispanic and Latino students in Buncombe County Schools, they um, comprise 25% of those retained, yet 21% of the student population and male students are more likely to be retained in both school systems. Setting the stage for a follow-up question related to high school graduation. All public high school students in North Carolina must meet minimum state graduation requirements in order to earn the diploma and graduate and these come from the State Department of Public Instruction. Um, they're considered the future ready course of study and that is based on a 22, a minimum of 22 credits to graduate. Our um, local schools uh, have a requirement of 28 credits to graduate in most cases. There are some 22 credit programs an example of that is Community High School, which is an alternative high school within the Buncombe County Schools system. To earn a credit for a course, a student uh, needs to have a passing grade of a D or better, which is a 60 or more. So the follow-up question that we're responding to here is how is the graduation rate possible with the third through eighth math and reading and ACT scores? You may recall that we reported an overall graduation rate in our community of 90%, more than 90%. And we also reported that roughly half of kindergarten through eighth graders did not demonstrate proficiency in math and reading and roughly similar rates for the um, 11th graders um, on the college readiness um, ACT exam. So it led some commissioners to wonder about the relationship between proficiency and graduation. Um, standardized tests like those uh, third through eighth grade reading and math tests and ACT, they measure proficiency. But graduation is based on more than only standardized tests. Um, in fact, the testing tends to account for only about 20 to 25% of a student's course grade. And other factors help contribute to their course grade, like attendance, assignments, conduct, exams, projects. So if they can um, together uh, across all of those factors, um, pass with a D or better, they will get credit for that course and earn uh, that, be able to apply that credit toward their graduation, regardless of the, their performance on a standardized test. Student growth. The uh, last follow-up question is how does this factor in? Student growth is a way of measuring progress rather than proficiency. Proficiency, of course, is the big long-term goal of, of education, but the near-term measure that can help us assess progress toward proficiency is student growth. It is not measured at the student level it's measured at the group level or school level based on demographics. They're, they use the end of grade or end of course tests as a standardized metric uh, at the state, at the North Carolina GPI, to determine student growth. And the data gets aggregated or combined for groups and divided into the categories of um, 
met, did not meet, or exceeded expectations for growth within the time frame. And there's a list of different standardized tests that are looked at. Here we have the demographic breakdown for student growth, and I'll walk you through it. Essentially, these are demographic groups of students within schools, and whether or not the groups did not meet, met, or exceeded expectations. The blue bars represent schools with students that did not meet. Orange bars are schools with students that met expectations. And gray bars are where students exceeded, the groups of students exceeded. Please note that in each subgroup, there's a different number of schools reporting, which is based on the size of the subpopulations within each school. So left to right, the subpopulations that are shown here are black, Hispanic, multiracial, white, and economically disadvantaged. About 88% of schools that report data for black students show that they're meeting or exceeding the expectations for growth. That's the orange plus the gray, meeting or exceeding. And that was for 16 schools reporting. It's 93% when you combine those two meeting and exceeding for Hispanic students. It's 100% for multiracial students, although there's only six schools that are in that reporting set. It's 83% for meeting or exceeding for white students, and 83% also for the economic disadvantage. So to conclude, I uh, just want to reiterate the county's commitment to education through our strategic plan. Um, and as we talked about last time, this comes into practice through programs and services and very much through partnerships. Um, we rely on our data uh, partnership with the school districts, with the public school systems, Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools for our data access and data analysis. And we also partner with other community organizations. You're gonna be hearing more from us in the coming months about our work with the P20 Council and My Future NC. And uh, we also have been pleased with the conversations spurred both internally and with our partners based on this education data review and intend to repeat it each year um, as a part of the strategic plan going forward. Um, so we will be back uh, with our next annual education data review um, at the top of the 2024 calendar year. Commissioner, any questions? Just to say thank you to you and other staff who worked hard to pull this data and, and that it um, feels like we're having kind of more focused and precise conversations than we've been able to have in the past, both in this setting and then it's also happening in the Early Child Education Committee where we have access to sort of a, a different level and depth of data around kindergarten readiness and intersections with equity. So um, just wanna appreciate that it hasn't happened on its own um, and it feels like it equips us in new ways as we think about policy level and budgetary um, kind of decision, decisions ahead of us. So, so just want to sort of take a moment to note that, and um, and there's a lot to digest here. So, I'd love to hear others' thoughts. All right. If there's no other questions or comments, um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Al. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks, Rachel. All right, the next uh, agenda item is uh, foundational equity strategic updates. And we've got a number of folks here <clears throat> helps out with this one. So I do have Tommy in, on here. Do you want me to go to introduce him then and get into it? Sounds great. Tommy, can you come forward? I'll let him speak for himself, but this is Tommy Laher and he's their field representative for Congressman Chuck Edwards' office here. So. 
you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Tommy Lauder. Uh, Mrs. Fender uh, has been so graciously to have, let me have a couple minutes of your time. I'm very, very appreciative of each of you allowing me to be here. I'm also, as a citizen, very appreciative of, of the time and the effort of your commitment to the constituents of Buncombe County and everything that you do, serving on boards in the past. I just can't, you know, compel myself to, to believe how it is to fill your shoes and how much time is involved, especially being servants for Buncombe County. So I'm so appreciative. Uh, Congressman Edwards, I've uh, been blessed to be a field representative for Congressman Edwards for about three months. And one of my counties is Buncombe County. Uh, and this is part of my process of coming to the commissioners and identifying myself and thanking each of you for allowing me to serve the constituents in your district, in your county. Uh, county Manager Fender has been gracious enough with, with, your, with your acceptance to allow me for the last couple of months to meet in the Human Services Building. Uh, our first month, um, the word hasn't got, hadn't got out enough and we only had three constituents. But last month, I rolled in at 15 minutes after nine and 16 constituents later, uh, I walked right out and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, we got a number of casework. We got a number of different attitudes on both sides, you know, and that's, you know, very similar to, to a small degree is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing because each of you have a, obviously have a commitment to try to help make this country better, help make Henderson, I mean, help make Buncombe County obviously better. We care about Henderson County too. Absolutely, and <laughs> I'm gonna get to that little tidbit in one minute. And our, and the, our commitment for our office, for Congressman Edwards' office, is a commitment to the first responders of each of our county. And I would like for each of you to be the first to know that we're gonna be in each one of the firehouses in Buncombe County. I know it's a large number, but in a month, I'm gonna personally be in every one of those firehouses to tell them how appreciative I am for the men and women of how, how much of a hard work and effort that they put in. And so with that, just a little tidbit, I uh, had lunch a couple of weeks ago with County Manager John Mitchell. He sent his best to the chairman, make sure that Chairman Newman knows that, that he sent his best and that he looks forward to seeing you and working with you some more in the future. Uh, Miss Edwards, he sent the best also to you. And then obviously our county manager, Miss Pender, he says to make sure that, that you know that lunch is coming and that he owes you that uh, immensely. And also on a side note, I, something that I'll finish with this, something that each of you already know, you're blessed with, if not the, the best, and you know, one of the best in my mind, most wonderful county managers and people that I'm thankful to meet in only three months. She has been accessible to me. We spent time having lunch. We spent time on the phone corresponding with emails and I have never met a finer person uh, in my whole entire life. She's just a wonderful lady. And again, um, I'm, I'm thankful for being here. Uh, she has my information, any help that the Congressman in office would, would like to have to assist you with any kind of grants, any, any kind of questions with any kind of offices or liaisons, most certainly the office is here to commit, committed to commu uh, constituency services. And with that, I know you have a, so much to do tonight. And I'll, I'll, that's all I got to say. And thank you very much. Uh, hey, thank you, uh, Tommy. Thanks so much for coming and introducing yourself. We really appreciate it, and uh, we appreciate the working relationship. So thank you for taking time and for, uh, uh, anyway, we look forward to working with you on Absolutely. many different issues facing uh, Buncombe County and Western North Carolina. So great to meet you. Thank you. That two hours worth of 16 people, you know, that's what it was worth, you know. And so uh, had the shirt tail untucked by 1130, but we got it done. So <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. So today we're gonna to talk about a strategic discussion. And don't worry, this is the last one for a little while. You won't be hearing me for a little while because I'm about to go and take some parental leave. So I'll see you back sometime in the late summer. <laughs> um, and we'll be back with another uh, strategic discussion probably in July or August. So today's foundational and the way the strategic plan works 
is foundational. It's really like one mega focus area with multiple focus areas within it. So you're actually gonna hear three percenters today. What you'll hear is Eric Rau, our IT director, will speak to you about operational excellence. Sharon Burke, our HR director, will speak to you about resources. And then Dr. Armstrong, our equity officer, will be speaking to you related to equity. Um, I'll be remiss to not mention that um, we have updated our strategic plan dashboard on buncombecounty.org. So it's new, it's nicer looking, it's crisper. Um, so if you wanna see our overall progress on the strategic plan, you can always go to buncombecounty.org and click on strategic plan. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Grau. Hi, commissioners. Nice to see you today. Uh, I will be talking about the uh, focus area of operational excellence. Um, while I am giving this presentation, I would like to acknowledge Strategy Innovation's work of leading a lot of this effort and putting this presentation together, the PowerPoint. Uh, but I'm also going to be speaking today on behalf of many departments, uh, uh, Strategy Innovation, IT, HR, CAPE, General Services, Budget, Finance, Internal Audit, Legal, Equity, and Human Rights. Right? These are our core support foundations, and uh, these are the, the departments that uh, provide that foundation that all of our programs run off of. So. Here we go. Uh, you may remember we had uh, four goals and we'll kind of break through each of these individually and I'm gonna talk some examples here. It's a little more narrative. Um, again, I'm representing a lot of folks here so I'm doing a little more reading today than I would probably normally if it was a IT presentation. Uh, so to start off, um, you may remember we have a, a goal of fostering an internal business culture focused on continuous improvement. I want to highlight a couple of these programs. Uh, the first one is this MindWorks program. This is a program that Strategy Innovation has put together. Uh, it's available for everyone in the organization. Uh, it focuses on continuous improvements, on elimination of waste, and building an organization where every single individual knows they can make a difference. Um, two em 200 employees to date have attended this MindWorks program. It's uh, presented at our NEO, and, and anyone um, can get involved very early in their career. Um, we've had lots of great examples of this. One recent example was our public health nurses uh, worked on a process to re uh, significantly reduce the time it takes for our public health to get uh, diapers into babies of needs. Uh, another one of these um, pillars of, of, of programmatic support around this initiative is the Buncombe County University, BCU. Um, BCU is, uh, exists to offer opportunities that are clear, relevant, and easily accessible to all Buncombe County employees. Uh, we have three programs that have been developed um, by this team. The first one is the BC Foundations Program, and that's available to all employees, uh, conduct of service, and, and what does it mean to be a county employee. Uh, there's another program uh, called BC Lead, and this is a, a robust leadership program uh, for both current supervisors as well as those who wish to join leadership positions. And then BC Skill Up, uh, that's a, a skill building course with job specific pathways. Uh, to date, we have 36 different uh, distinct courses from our L&D program. Uh, it's, and last year, that was represented 4,154 enrollees in these courses and 9,737 9, hours of learning. Another one of our goals in the foundation era is to assure that all policies reflect ethical principles. And we've done a lot of work in the policy world. I know a lot of them have been presented to you over the last couple of years. Um, our policy process begins, we gather subject matter experts uh, and experienced policy writers and they iterate between editing and drafting the policy. That policy goes to a steering committee for more feedback and ensuring that the policy is simple, is equitable in impact, doesn't interfere with other policies, um, and whether it achieves the goal of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the steering committee votes it out of review, and then the policy is further reviewed by county leadership and directors for find, finding its way um, for back for additional edits. And as of today, 51 policies have been uh, rewritten or written in the last, um, since the strategic uh, plan started. Another really important area, a uh, goal is to ensure all decisions promote the county's financial health and long-term interest. Um, for the first time, we have an IT, or I'm sorry, we have an enterprise-wide uh, 
technical solution around budgeting. We have a budgeting tool that uh, all departments now use. And furthermore, that uh, budgeting tool, we align all budget requests to various strategic initiatives. Um, this applies to operating budgets, position requests, ITGC, capital improvement projects, vehicle requests, and more. And speaking of you know, some of these uh, committees, uh, we've been developing these cross-departmental committees such as ITGC or the Capital Improvement Team, and they evaluate um, whether technology or capital, and the, the VET was the Vehicle Evaluation Team. Uh, these committees score uh, requests based upon evaluative criteria such as strategic alignment, internal efficiencies, operational necessities. And really to say this collaborative approach is really attempting to ensure that we get the maximum usage out of our dollars and our investments. Uh, the last goal in this section is to leverage and maximize technologies, plans, and studies to enhance the safety and capabilities of the infrastructure. This is one I do know a little bit about, the cybersecurity investments, right? They have been significant. Uh, we've taken some of these to you guys for you know, approval. Uh, it is a scary world out there of increasing cybersecurity risk. Uh, we've absolutely focused on our cybersecurity efforts. We've adopted the National Institute of Science and Technology Cybersecurity Risk Framework through that policy committee. We've actively trained users in phishing awareness, partnered with service providers, provide 24-7 monitoring, and built out many technical uh, management and operational controls. Uh, the county is also actively investing in security of our facilities programs and the running of our elections. We have deployed new security measures uh, in our facilities, such as our alerted security system. We've done tabletop exercises around active shooters, as well as um, election security. Uh, and we're working with local partners to be ready to prepare for potential incidents in our facilities and within the community. And lastly, uh, in conjunction with the flexible work arrangement policy, the county has implemented a facility study over the last few years. Uh, to assess current and future space needs. Uh, this work has allowed county to offload several aging buildings, uh, cost savings uh, approaching about a million dollars per year. Uh, we also, the flexible work arrangement resulted in significant sustainability gains with an 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emission associated with employees commuting to work. Uh, this effort has earned the county a clean air award from our regional air quality agency and has been showcased at national conferences. In addition to the flexible work arrangement policy and the facility study have provided the county with opportunity to consider uh, repurposing county facilities for affordable housing. So three years into our current strategic plan, we have made significant progress in implementing it. Uh, we do provide regular updates to the county commissioners on the progress of the plan. We do budget by strategic uh, plans. And we've created that dashboard that Raphael is talking about uh, to break silos and increase collaboration throughout the county. So just some numbers and some, some nice pictures. And there's Raphael presenting an award for Mineworks. Funny, they put the presentation together just to be on it. <laughs> uh, in the next section, I'll turn it over to Sharon Burke to talk about many of our resources here at Buckingham County. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. So the three uh, goals that I'm gonna be talking about today is to ensure that Buncombe County is an employer of choice in our region, to optimize our funding and partnerships and increase public engagement opportunities for input in county programs, projects, and initiatives. So our first goal, again, was to ensure Buncombe County is an employer of choice. And some of the areas that we've been working on um, pretty significantly were in to increase the county's presence at diversity and equity sites and events and increase our diversity of county, the county workforce. And some of the examples I can, I can share with you is that we've been doing a lot of partnerships with the local middle high school um, higher education um, institutions within not just Buncombe County, but also uh, outside our county to see if we can bring folks in that um, are more diverse. We've also invested um, heavily in advertising both within our community and outside our community through diversity sites that focus on individuals that um, we would love to have uh, join our community. So 
The next is to ensure that Buncombe County is an employer of choice in the region. And so as you're aware, we implemented a salary study, um, which really was creating a foundation for compensation and classification. And it also looked at how we look at salaries through an equity lens, which is really, really important. We also enhanced our benefits. And um, when you look at our flexible work, um, the work from home program, our enhancing benefit package, yeah, this year alone, we started with mental health, and we looked at increasing our EAP to 10 visits. Um, our teledoc, we have a reduced uh, copay for our teledoc. On top of that, we have um, increased our life insurance. We have increased our ancillary benefits, our dental benefits. On top of that, um, we have also looked at paid parental leave and really looked at the leave process that um, families um, need to be able to work um, just to be able to work, you know, whether it's for Buncombe County or any, any other employer. Um, you know, and then one of the other programs that I think is really important to mention, um, because it's, it's a way to keep our employees healthy, and that was we introduced a free PT, physical therapy program. And what that means is, is it's, yes, it helps our employees by you know, allowing them to go see a therapist, but what we realized as a county is, you know, when we actually looked into starting this program, it cost about $110 per member per month, um, and that was about $53 above the industry standard. By implementing this free PT program, what that did was it reduced our cost to about $86 per member per month, which is now, we, it has gotten us down to about $14 above industry. So as we start looking at just the cost, that's what some of the enhanced benefits. So it's, it's looking at how we can offer more benefits to our employees, but at a reduced cost to the county. Optimizing our funding and partnerships. So in our portfolio, our grants portfolio, we have over $100 million um, that is, is represented in this, this area. And more specifically, what they have done in this area is looking at enhancing our grants management. And for the very first time, we had, have stood up and hired a grants manager to actually manage this whole process, which is, is, is insanely large. Um, and I think it's, it's really important that um, for everyone to understand is we don't work in a silo. And to make Buncombe County as great as it is, it's our partnerships, our partnerships with our community members. You know, it's, it's looking at our fire districts, our education partners, our nonprofits, and so many other organizations that um, just came right up shoulder to shoulder and helped us um, through COVID. Um, and, you know, when we look at just the fire departments alone, you know, the, the work that they did with the COVID, you know, helping us roll out COVID you know, vac vaccines, you know, um, more recently, the 911 assistance that they have provided us in our telecommunication center, um, you know, in, in the hurricanes that have hit our area and, and, and just helping our, our residents. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And the last is to increase public engagement opportunities for the input on county programs. And so over the last three years, we have stood up um, a community and edu uh, I'm sorry, communications and public engagement department, which is really focused on public um, communication, really getting uh, our county's input. And so looking at the um, comprehensive plan, you know, making sure that, that our residents had a voice. Um, the COVID-19 COVID vaccine program, you know, making sure that all our residents knew about what was offered. You know, and then what I think was really kind of a fun thing was the youth art contest on, on I Voted sticker, which is pretty cool. And Dr. Armstrong? So before Dr. Armstrong comes up, because it's a little bit of a shift, right, from kind of internal services to equity, I just want to give you all an opportunity while you're on the mindset of this, you all have any questions or follow-up that you would like related to what Eric and Sharon presented. If not, let's work for my team, so. Great, thanks. <laughs> All right, Dr. Armstrong. Good afternoon. Let's see. All right, so equity. Um, so first, I'd just like to say I'm excited to be here, excited to be a part of this team. Um, being a part of equity and inclusion is very important to me. I truly believe that equity and inclusion fosters innovation 
and it's key to my goal um, to help the county have equity for all. Um, and so the strategic vision, systems, policies, and practices that support equity for all people. Um, I know we have led with race, and my goal is to keep that, that race going and then move into other intersections of equity. So what is equity and why lead with race? As you can see, it's defined as a state of being just, impartial, and fair. Um, our equity inclusion work group, which was started long before I got here, and they've done some really great work, um, focused on building a sustainable culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And they have been instrumental with uh, leading with race. Um, the, ex the racial equity training modules have been completed and ongoing trainings are offered. Um, and one of the reasons why we started with race is because we know that it's the largest disparity across all sectors and focusing on racial equity helps us to get our systems and structures in place in order to improve all types of equity. So as we are getting race and leading with race and getting equity and inclusive procedures in place, then we can move on with the next set of procedures talking about differing abilities, LGBTQIA, sexual orientation, and the like. So some of our goals, ensure that policies and practices eliminate barriers to allow for equitable opportunities and ensure representative and inclusive practices are reflected in decision making. So we are really working to weave equity and inclusion into the fabric of the county's work. We're getting out into the community, we're having various events, we're encouraging community members to attend various meetings, IFA meetings, reparations, and we're also relying on data to inform our decisions and um, teaching us and how to utilize the data um, to make the changes where necessary and where needed. Um, and so as you can see, create authentic community dialogue to advance equity, develop equitable policies and procedures, and increase capacity to make those data informed decisions. Community engagement, um, justice services and safety, justice challenge, um, so these programs were developed with the idea to reduce barriers and to learn the why and the how of justice-involved individuals and to collect valuable data on how well um, initiatives are working. So one of those last ones there on the slide, the court notification system um, has been implemented and now we're waiting to receive feedback. Of all the people that it was introduced to when they came to court, 85% of people selected to be signed up for the court notification system. And so our hope is that we're going to see that this helps in the reduction of um, failure to appear, because um, we know that failure to appear is the second largest reason why African-American males end up back in Buncombe County jails. So community engagement continued with the planning of the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan 2043 um, will have the largest impact on our children of today. And so they were very intentional, intentional about going into the city and county schools, and they asked the children to create a postcard of their vision for the county and their lives as adults um, in the county. And so this is one of the images from one of those drawings. Um, but also the planning department have been very intentional in going out and getting information from the voices of people who are normally not heard. And that is a part of that equity and inclusion. Oh, and if you can't see, it says, I love doing whatever I want. So that's what they're looking forward to about being an adult. Oh, in 20, and I remember feeling that same way. Uh-oh, went too far. Make sure I'm, okay. Um, and then community <laughs> engagement. And so you have intentional in meeting the community, creating opportunities for engagement, especially with marginalized and underrepresented populations informing, connecting, and sharing of resources along with providing free food for residents. And all of this summarizes into that CAPE and community engagement had the idea that they wanted to be intentional with legacy neighborhoods or with historically black neighborhoods to show our interest in hearing their stories and from learning from them and to show our investment in hearing those stories and taking them and applying them to the work that we do moving forward. So equity, Employee Equity Training 2022 at a Glance facilitated 72 hours of equity and inclusion courses via four modules presented nine times each, worked with 258 county employees and had a total of 915 people attend the 36 modules. And as of yesterday, we did modules one through four all day training 
and we have 30 people in attendance there as well. Um, and finally, we are working on the LGBTQIA training models and hope to get those out during the summer. Increasing use of equity and data. Um, so the disaggregation and analysis of data by race across departments, um, mostly that is talking about that more departments are getting used to narrowing the focus of, or maybe I should say widening the focus of the data that they collect. And so making sure to start breaking down the data by demographics so we can have a more informed information about who's taking our surveys, who's attending, who's being supported, and maybe some areas of where we could have growth and improvement. The equity index map, commonly now referred to as the community index map after some feedback from the equity and inclusion work group, is a uh, community index map where Buncombe County uh, is broken out into census blocks. And it was created based on nine data points from the American Community Survey. So those nine points are socioeconomic, um, median household income, socioeconomic percentage of households below poverty, socioeconomic percentage of 21, or 21 and older without high school diploma or equivalent, socioeconomic, the percentage of households in, uh, that are receiving food stamps or SNAP, healthcare, the percentage of the population who receive Medicaid or are uninsured, Housing, the gross rent as a percentage of income. Housing, the mortgage percent of income of 30 or greater. Demographics, the percentage of the population that are less than 18 years old. And demographics, the percentage of the populations that are greater than 65. And so this is a new uh, tool that has been implemented and I've been working closely since being brought on to learn more about the tool what we can do with that information from this tool and how we can use that to inform our data. Um, all policies and positions requests reviewed through an equity lens. All enterprise-wide projects are reviewed with the equity analysis tool and all budget expansion requests are reviewed through equity lens. And so all three of these kind of fall under, specifically fall under my office and my team in that we are working very hard with department heads and business um, plan managers to make sure that as they are working on their budget, as they're working on projects, as they're requesting expansions, that they're doing it through this equity lens and making sure to be inclusive. Oops. One more. Go back. So policy impacting equity. Um, so increased flexibility, the flexible workplace policy and leave policies, um, these are all been some of those things that fall under the ability to recruit, blah, reduce barriers um, and create space for employees to be themselves. Through the affinity group, we have the professionals of color affinity group and the BU affinity group that are um, organizing and meeting and creating ideas and questions and um, bringing things to the table that could be considered for policy changes, um, all in the effort to be equitable and inclusive and created more opportunities for employees to impact equity efforts through policy and development processes. And again, our office, the equity office, is being really intentional on making sure we are serving on these committees and in these meetings where policy is being developed to ensure that equity lens is being used in that process. And lastly, equity in action. So in my short time of being here, just wanna share a few things that we have coming down the pipeline. So our racial equity action plan, community engagement plan is in the works. Um, we are scheduling dates and meeting times to have lunch and learns, to have community events, and to hopefully have a large uh, conference on racial equity around mid-fall. Uh, we have the REAP dashboard that has gone live. It is open to the public. We are excited about that. The public can go on and see our results for fiscal year 23. Um, and we are currently in the process of reviewing the equity impact analysis tool, how well it worked for our departments, um, receiving feedback from them, and figuring out what edits we need to do so that this tool can be used consistently moving forward. Um, we have a lunch and learn, or I have a lunch and learn actually scheduled with faith leaders coming up later this month. And we are working on rolling out the racial equity conference. That is all, any questions?
put the PowerPoint back up and go back to the actual graphic of the um, strategic plan. Commissioners, as they're pulling that back up, what's on those second slide? Oh, from the very beginning? Yes. Commissioners, we've now gone through all of the pillars, educated and capable communities, the environment and energy group, resident well-being, as well as vibrant economy, and today it was the foundational focus areas. Um, so tell us the process, if there's anything in there that you want to see differently as we bring them start the next year. We will go back and focus on each one individually, bring you decisions, bring you the data that we've collected. And if you have questions, well, that's the process we've developed. If there's any changes you want to that process, let us know. And, and also, this is 2025. We're almost two years out, so we'll start thinking about what our next strategic plan will look like and what our next five-year goals will look like. And we'll start what's that process look like as we start to dig into the second five-year series. So if there's anything differently that you want us to do as we go into our next report out, let us know that. This has been um, such a great process. Thank, thank you all. Um, I, as we head into the next cycle of reporting out, I'd, I'd be interested in staff's thoughts on whether there's ways to um, kind of identify any areas that, that we're working on, regardless of which of the four pillars it's under, where the kind of light's flashing, if that makes sense. Um, either for good reasons, we're making significant progress and there's good news to report, or concerning reasons, um, a metric that we're trying to move in one direction is moving at a sharp level in the other direction. And th that's sort of a taking our cross, it, it's sort of monitoring the dashboard simultaneously, but I think, I, relevant at least to some of the conversations we're having, it feels like it's always helpful to understand like, okay, what strategies are proving to be very impactful um, and, there's, and there's real momentum around them and then, uh, and then where are some of the um, uh, alarms going off that we should be cognizant of as we think about, um, as we think about our work in the coming year. And I have, <coughs> I'd like to commend you and the staff because for 40 years in banking, we did a strategic plan every year, every five years. And every five years, one month after we did it, it was gone into five, the next four and a half years. But what you have done is made it become what it should be, a living document, something that we have a roadmap for us and that you're open to change. And this is what we need. Uh, to be successful in this century. So all I'll say to you is keep up the good work. And don't worry, we'll let you know if we have questions or concerns. I assure you that from the commission. But thank you for, like I said, making it a true living document, something that we are using. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that's everything that was on our agenda for the briefing meeting. So um, we're adjourned and we'll reconvene at five o'clock.